everybody, welcome back. I am Amy Rowe. I am a loan officer with Mid-Atlantic Farm Credit in our Salisbury, Maryland office. So I'm sure I'm gonna hit on some points that Steve discussed on the previous session, but um, just think of it as it means it's extra important. So we'll get started. So just a quick question for everyone. Um, was there a key takeaway from the last session that you thought was impactful to you or your business? It was mind blowing, right? <laughs> no, that's true. So um, I will say Steve did talk a good bit about Marbidco's programs and how that can really be utilized with other partnerships from other lenders to really make a good financial lending package that can be a benefit to your operation. So just a little bit about what we're gonna cover in this session. We're obviously gonna talk a little bit about Mid-Atlantic Farm Credit because Mid-Atlantic Farm Credit's here. And then um, a little bit about commercial loan programs, types of loans, a little bit about preparing for your lender in the five C's of credit. Steve did touch on this in the previous one, but it's just a little bit of a different perspective from the farm credit system or a commercial lender. And then partnering with different agencies. I think this is really key because it's gonna show how we can work with Marbidco, FSA, some other state or federal um, programs. And again, it's just a really good way to put together some different loan programs that can help really enhance one of our loans. And then we're also going to talk about business resources and some planning tools. So I do have a business plan. We can go through it. So if you did grab a handout, we can go through that. And then just some different links and resources. All right, so Mid-Atlantic Farm Credit covers a couple of different states in the region. So with that being said, we do have 17 different offices, so you can see that there. Um, the firm credit system in itself does cover all 50 states, so we are a na nationwide network. Um, with that, we're the leading agricultural lender in America, and um, we partner with farmers and ranchers to provide reliable and consistent credit. Um, our staff members are experts in agriculture and offer a variety of financial services, including land and lot loans, equipment loans. We'll go through those different programs a little bit later. And then Farm Credit's a cooperative. So that's kind of where we differ a little bit from a commercial lender. Um, it's how we were brought together by Congress back um, over 100 years ago to provide that um, reliable, consistent credit to rural America, but once you are, once you have a loan with Farm Credit, you're a member of Farm Credit. So that's kind of nice in the fact that you get to vote on different issues and you also receive patronage. So patronage is basically like a dividend. If you want to learn more about it, you just go to www.mafc.com and just search patronage. And it's got a really cool calculator on it and what patronage does is it effectively lowers your interest rate by about 65 basis points. So if we were looking at a 5% loan, it's really gonna be more like 4.45% once you receive that patronage back. Patronage is distributed each year, typically in April, March, April. Um, so you can see we service farmers in Delaware, Majority of Maryland, there is um, Farm Credit of the Virginias and Colonial Farm Credit that actually supports Southern Maryland. And then also um, parts of West Virginia, obviously the Eastern Shore of Virginia and Pennsylvania. So I thought this was kind of surprising. I think folks typically think, oh, Farm Credit, we only do poultry and grain, right? But we do a lot of different stuff. Um, and have a lot of different members with a variety of different operations. So I thought this was cool that really over 50% um, of our portfolios, portfolio is actually a mixture, not just poultry and grain. So did that surprise y'all at all or you kind of thought that? Okay. 
So a little bit about our programs, and we'll go again through each one of them. But um, obviously, Farm Credit does farm loans, um, equipment loans. We have Farm Credit Express, which is kind of like dealer financing, um, livestock purchases, lines of credit, refinancing, building or fencing loans, lot loans, home loans, personal auto loans, and leases. Um, each type of loan is different, and it's typically a different term and length or length of loan and use of proceeds for each one. So first off is a land loan. So it can be called a land loan or a farm ownership loan. It's obviously to purchase land or a farm. The term of the loan is typically 20 to 30 years. Um, it's considered a long-term mortgage or a long-term loan. So um, I know if you worked with Shannon on one of the previous sessions, she definitely talked about the balance sheet. So this would co be considered a long-term liability. And typically, we require at least 20% down. And that's where working with Marbidco or FSA can benefit if that down payment is not available. So next up is equipment loans. So it's a loan to purchase equipment. So it can be specialized equipment. It's not like it's just got to be a tractor or a combine. It can even be like um, for organic farming, they have the um, fire weeder or whatever. It can be to purchase that. Um, dealership financing is an option when you're talking about equipment loans in general. So John Deere Financial obviously have 0% financing sometimes for their newer, newer equipment. Um, and they may have some different programs, and I say John Deere, multitude of dealerships, but um, you know they may have some different programs for older equipment as well. Plug in for Farm Credit Express. So Farm Credit Express is our dealership financing. So I'm just gonna say, if you went to Atlantic Tractor or something like that, um, which is one of the local John Deere dealerships, I guess I'm plugging John Deere today, uh, the ter um, then you would actually get a loan through Farm Credit. So you would become a Farm Credit member. You would actually have a loan officer with Farm Credit. So it's not like you have somebody out wherever in Iowa um, or Illinois, but you would actually have a local loan officer. Um, you would just get the loan through the dealership. So it's just a really good option if anyone's interested. So term of the loan is typically less than seven years. It goes back to the fact that typically you depreciate equipment out for seven years, and so that's kind of where that is equivalent or relevant. Um, it's considered an intermediate or short-term short loan. So my background is in FSA, so a lot of people just do current loans and long-term um, loans or liabilities, but FSA does intermediate, so I always <laughs> say intermediate is part of that. So it's just kind of the middle, right? It's about seven years. Um, it can be called an operating loan, so sometimes people will say, well, I want a term operating loan, so that could be equipment. It can also be livestock, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Or right now. So <laughs> this is a loan to purchase livestock. Um, the term of the loan is typically less than seven years for breeding livestock, and the term of the loan is typically less than a year for market livestock. It can be, again, called a term operating loan or just an operating loan. Um, the difference there is, and I think sometimes people forget, so breeding livestock, you're going to continue to have them, right? They're going to be a part of your herd. You're going to have you know, these breeding livestock for hopefully seven years. Um, where market livestock, so if you're talking about a steer or whatnot, that's going to be less than a year. You're going to take them off the farm. And so that's how the term of the loan is justified from that perspective. And then lines of credit. It's considered an annual operating loan or just an operating loan. People have different terminologies for it. Line of credit, whatnot. Um, basically, this loan is for operating expenses occurring or occurred within a year or a season. So the term of the loan is typically no longer than 12 months because it's a full year or full cycle. Um, it's considered a current liability. It can be revolving or non-revolving. And I will say, do y'all know the difference between revolving and non-revolving? <coughs> Probably, 
Yeah. Um, so revolving is going to be basically where you have, say, $10,000 as a line of credit, and you take out $5,000. Well, you sold, it's probably smaller, but you sold a, lo a load of grain, right? And you put the $5,000 back in. Well, you can take that $5,000 back out. So it's continuously revolving. Where non-revolving is truly like you have $10,000 for the year. Once you take out $5,000, you only have $5,000. Um, if you take out all of the $10,000, you're done. It's not going to revolve back. And then refinancing. So refinancing the debt that's already been financed. Something to think about. It's also something to be cautious about. Part of that is there can be a multitude of reasons to refinance. Obviously, it can be to reduce the rate. Um, it could be a change of circumstance in the operation. So um, it could be you had a bad year, you know, a year ago. You're still trying to get through it, um, and you just need to spread out the term just a smidge longer to get you back on track where cash flow is comfortable. Um, that can all be part of refinancing. Um, it can be you just, you know, you're looking for another lender or whatnot, and you come to another lender to refinance the debt. I would be cautious depending on the operation, and I say this a good bit, talk to your accountant because they're the ones that can really help you through some of these um, different refinances that could affect your taxes, however you've depreciated out something. So just again, be cautious, but you know, it can be a great opportunity for someone that just needs to extend the term out a little bit or get that reduction of rate so you can reduce that payment amount. So the other one of these is building or fencing loans. So this is really the financing of a fixed asset on a property. So it's not like equipment, and I always go back to poultry because it's the easiest way to visualize this. So, you know, the waterers, the feeders, um, that's equipment. You can take that out of the houses. Um, your feed bins more so, and obviously the structure itself, that's a fixture, and that's what this is going to be. It's a fixed asset on a property. Fencing loans are typically no longer than seven years, and it's really to build a fence um, or any kind of infrastructure from that perspective. And then building loans are typically no longer than 15 years, and that would be for pole buildings, poultry operations, hog operations, dairy operations, anything like that. The reason that they're no longer than 15 years typically is because you're looking at the life cycle of that asset. And that's what all of this comes down to from a term perspective is what's the life cycle of the asset itself? So, you know, if you're purchasing a poultry operation and, you know, it's got 20 acres and four poultry houses, the majority of your actual asset and the value of that property is in those four chicken houses, right? It's not in that land. It's, I mean, it had, the land definitely has value, but it's also in those poultry houses itself. So we're going to look at that when we determine term more so than the land itself. It gets a little different when there's a little more acreage, but it's really looking at what is that life cycle of that asset. And depending on what it is, it obviously can be an intermediate or short-term loan or a long-term loan, depending on the term. So farm credit also do, does consumer loans. This can be for more than just full-time farmers or part-time far farmers. This can just be for rural residents in general. Um, and all these loan types, most lenders will do. I will say that farm credit specializes more in agriculture or real estate and equipment, um, but definitely something, you know, just to think about. Lot loans are typically less than five acres. So once you get over five acres on land, typically it's considered more of a farm than just a lot, right? Um, our lot loans are typically uh, less than 15 years for the term, and then um, other lenders will have, require more of a down payment or a lesser term, just depending on who you're using. Home loans, purchase of your primary residence, so does have to be your primary residence. 
The term of the loan is typically less than 30 years. It can be shorter, obviously, depending on your cash flow. And then you also have personal and auto loans. So Steve touched on this a little bit, but obviously auto loans, you're purchasing a car or truck. Term is typically less than seven years, typically more like three to five, but can go up to seven. And then a personal loan can be used for a multitude of reasons. Um, usually it's less than five years on the term. Um, sometimes it's even three years. And then the last one is um, actually leases. That's not really a loan. It can be at the end of it, but you're financing of equipment or structures. So they do leases for solar buildings. Um, term of the loan depends on the item being leased. There is dealership leasing, firm credit has leasing, um, but typically there's a buyback at the end of the lease. So you're paying a lease payment of X and then at the end of the lease term, you may have, I don't know, 5,000 left, maybe 50,000 we'll say, but 50,000 less and that can be turned into a loan. But I will say leases are kind of interesting because you count the lease as an expense on your taxes versus if you purchased a piece of equipment, you would depreciate it out. So main thing, again, talk to your accountant because they're gonna be able to see your overall financial picture and what makes the most sense from past history and future planning. Does anybody have any questions about the types of loans? Okay. So next up is preparing for your lender. Pretty basic in a lot of ways. Um, we're gonna need a balance sheet, so <laughs> I think everybody talks about Balance sheet and cash flow is the most important things or most important documents you can probably have followed by a business plan. Um, and typically a business plan includes cash flow and balance sheets. So. But when you meet with a lender, you come to Farm Credit or anyone else, Marbidco as well, FSA, they're gonna request a balance sheet, your last three years of taxes, both personal and business, copy of your driver's license, and copy of your last two pay stubs if available. And then depending on what you're gonna wanna do, we also may request any kind of environmental permits or anything like that. The business plan, we'll go in more depth a little bit further along, but it doesn't have to necessarily be formal. Obviously we have a guideline for a business plan, but you just need to know what you're gonna do, what the costs are gonna be, what the income's gonna be, what are you really planning to do and what are your goals? Um, have you thought through what the pricing's gonna be if you're doing like vegetables? Um, you know, have you really thought what that cash flow is gonna look like? And if you wanna purchase a new piece of equipment or a, purchase a piece of land, do you know how you're gonna pay for it? And that's something that you really should think about before you even come to a lender. And I will say too, especially regarding a business plan, make sure you really think about projections because I think some folks just think, well, I have equity in this property, um, I should be able to get a loan. Well, that's great, but most, most lenders are not equity lenders. We're cash flow based. We definitely want you to have equity in the property, but we wanna make sure that it can pay for itself. So y'all have already went through a balance sheet, but I just think it's kind of important to go back through it again because a balance sheet and cash flow or an income statement is what we look at. Um, so really quick, assets are typically on your left, liabilities are on your right. So everything you own, everything you owe. Um, it is a snapshot in time. So what if you do a December 31st balance sheet, it could be completely different January 15th. It's truly just a snapshot in time. This is what I own. This is what I owe as of this date. Um, the nice part about December 31st balance sheets, I'm sure others can contest to this as well, is once we have consistent balance sheets year over year, so if you consistently do December 31st balance sheets, we can see how you've been growing your operation, how you've been utilizing your cash, 
what you've been doing, and we can start looking at trends. And that's where that kind of really plays a good part to that. And then income statement. So really it's just what's your income, what are your expenses, and it's usually over a year period or at least a growing season. But typically we look at it year over year. I will say, did Shannon go over accrued versus cash basis income statements a little bit? Okay. So um, basically, a cash basis income is going to be what truly um, you have received that cash. It is what has come in. It is you have that cash. Where accrued income statements counts, basically it accounts receivable. So you haven't gotten the cash yet, but you know you're going to get it. Um, Either way, the statement shows income, subtracts expenses, and ends with a net profit or loss for an accounting period. So kind of some other non-financial items to discuss. I think it's pretty important is what do you do? What's your operation in itself? How many acres do you farm? What do you do? What's the scale of it? Um, who owns it? Um, are there any key management roles? What's your experience? Do you have a succession plan? Is the next generation going to pick it up? Or are you going to sell? What, what are you going to do? Um, as well as production information. And I will say, just to know, like, you're an average performer above, below. You know, if we're looking at just truly like corn and bean operation, what are typically your average yields? Um, and that way we can truly have a better picture of what is to be expected in the next year. So when we do our projection, it's more accurate. And then any kind of legal entity documentation. So if you are an LLC or any type of entity in itself, we're going to need your articles of organization and your operating agreement. That's kind of just standard. Anybody have any questions so far? Okay. So <laughs> Steve went over this again, but I think it's just really important on the five C's of credit. I mean, this is how we make a loan. So we look at the five C's of credit, and this is what either gets a loan approved or denied. Um, and I will say that it's kind of nice to know, too, again, it goes back to that balance sheet and income statement or your tax returns. Um, when we start looking at a balance sheet, that's what we're going to look at from a capital perspective and a collateral perspective. So um, that's why the, that document is so important is that's what we're going to look at when we look at your capital and your collateral. Um, I will say liquidity is pretty important when it comes to capital. Um, could you pay one of your one year of payments right now? And then um, for collateral, What's available for a lender to take a lien on? Or is, you know, is there a secondary source of repayment? That's what we're going to really look at there. And then capacity is really going to be based off either a projected income statement or tax returns. So it's really going to show what is your repayment capacity, what's the debt coverage ratio. Um, I will tell you farm credit standard for debt coverage ratio is 125%. So that's what we're going to look at there. And then conditions. It's just basically we put conditions on a loan to help manage post-close um, risk. So it could be that how funds are distributed, whether they're distributed directly to you or if they're distributed to whoever you're purchasing something from or having work done for, if you're building a building or something of that nature. Um, it can be auto-draft, so say you know, you may have some slow payments, something like that. Um, we may require auto draft just to ensure that we get paid. It can be that insurance is required or environmental permits are required. It can be anything of that nature. And then character. Um, that's going to be, you know, your credit score. It's so important. I will say I think people forget how important a credit score is, but we do look at your credit score and what's your history of paying others. Um, part of character as well as, you know, how is, how is your management skills? Um, you know, what, what do you 
have as experience. That's what that's going to regard when it comes to character. So a little bit about our lending partnerships. Obviously, we work with Marbidco um, pretty heavily. There are other state programs, depending on where you're located as well. Um, for Maryland, definitely Marbidco um, is who we utilize. FSA is part of USDA. So FSA has two different sides to it. It has programs, so if you receive ARC PLC payments or NAP or whatnot, that's going to be the program side. And then they have a loan side as well. So their loan side is what I'll talk about a little bit because that's what we utilize probably the most as a lender. They have direct and guaranteed loan programs. So two distinct items when it comes to direct and guarantee. So guaranteed loan programs is actually not a loan between you and FSA. It is a partnership with the lender and it basically backs the bank. So it guarantees that if there is a loss on a property or on a loan, that FSA would guarantee basically 90% of that back to the lender. So it's just a little bit different than say a direct loan where it's truly between you and FSA. You are FSA's customer. Direct loans have two different types of it, and technically the guaranteed loan program does as well, but I'm gonna focus more on the direct side because you can utilize that as a customer yourself. So direct loans have farm ownership loans and they have operating loans. So farm ownership is gonna to be to purchase land or a farm. FSA can go up to 40 years, Typically, they're not going to. They're going to look at it same way as we do. What are you purchasing? What is the life, life um, expectancy, I guess, for that asset? So are you purchasing a um, poultry operation? That's going to be 15 years or less. Are you purchasing cropland or vacant land? You know, that's when that 20, 30, 40 <laughs> years could come into play, but typically 20 or 30. Um, they have joint financing with that. So the joint financing program is actually pretty cool. And the fact that if you have less than 50% of the overall loan with FSA, so even if it's 49%, right, 50% or less, then you get the benefit of a lower interest rate than even their rate with a firm ownership loan. So I think right now they're at like 2.5%. So you get that rate for your experience with FSA. So FSA does have a graduation requirement. Um, with that being said, as when you get to the point where you can receive full financing with a commercial lender, they require you to graduate from that program. Um, but until then, you get the benefit of their rate and their term. Operating loans with FSA are similar to what I talked about previously. They're gonna either be for equipment and livestock, so a term operating loan, or they're gonna be an annual operating loan, which is gonna be a non-revolving line of credit. Less than 12 months for that season, and then you would pay it back. Any questions about FSA? It's pretty, pretty simple from that perspective. I have a link to their website at the end of the presentation. And then I put up here owner financing. So when I talked about, and this is more probably for land loans than anything else, but I talked about that 20% down, right? So if you do not have, we'll say the 10% that maybe Marbidco requires, um, and you don't meet FSA's guidelines, so one of FSA's guidelines for a direct farm ownership loan is that you've had to participate in the business operation of a farm for three out of the past 10 years. So if you don't meet that requirement for a farm ownership, and depending on the owner, you may ask if they would hold a um, seller-held mortgage. Again, that's gonna be based on the seller. That is not something everybody is willing to do or will do, but it is an option that can help with some of the down payment requirement if others are not be able to be met. I thought I'd give you all some examples of how we would utilize some different programs with either Marbidco or FSA. So um, I just kind of put up there. So a beginning farmer um, was looking at a piece of property with um, 
a land preservation opportunity, and they had limited down payment requirements, right, or, or capabilities. So we may go to Marbidco, or the customer may go to Marbidco and say like, hey, look, I wanna purchase this 100 acres, right? But I don't have the 20% down that farm credit's gonna request. So they can utilize Marbidco's next gen program to help us with our down payment um, requirement and us be able to make the loan. And they get a lesser loan amount because the down payment's obviously the um, next gen amount. And then, you know, a customer wanted to start their own farming operation and had worked for another farmer or had just done it on the side for the past three years, we could use FSA joint financing to purchase a piece of land. So it's just kind of utilizing different tools in our toolbox to make sure that we look at all perspectives to be able to make a loan. Here's just another example. So customers looking at a larger property or a smaller property, it doesn't have to be that large, but um, their business plan is strong. You've really thought it through. You know how it's gonna be repaid. You know you've thought it through, right? Um, cash flow shows a coverage ratio of 135%, but you only have a 10% down payment. That's where Mr. Biff would come in handy from that perspective. So again, it's just utilizing different programs to ensure that we're really making you successful. Because I don't want to make a bad loan. I don't think anybody wants to make a bad loan. Um, it's really just how do we set this up correctly where it makes sense for your operation. And then again, um, customer has a well thought out business plan. The operation's not fully established and there's some risk involved with the operation. Um, maybe it's just a market that they haven't fully explored yet. They've thought it out, but there's not been an actual, they haven't actually sold anything. It could be, I don't know, going from vegetables to flowers, right? You kind of know the distribution channels, you probably know what your cost per acre is, but you just haven't done it quite yet. Um, most of this credit standards are met with farm credit. We may request a guarantee from FSA, which just protects us more than anything else and allows us to make the loan. So I really wanted to make sure we talked about this. Um, so you're approved, now what? So you've brought us all the information, we've worked through all the numbers, it sounds like it's gonna be a great loan, we make the loan, you sign the papers, now what, right? Your relationship shouldn't stop there. Invite your lender to visit your operation. Don't be surprised when we show an interest in what you're doing. Um, we we want to know how the operation's going, what's going on, what are your struggles, what are you proud of, say you got a new contract for, from someone. You know, that's the stuff that we want to know about. We want to know, like, hey, I had a heck of a year with my corn crop. Like, you know, that's, we want to know that. Um, Stay in touch in good times, and especially the bad. I think a lot of folks think they've had a bad year, like maybe I'll be a little slow with payments, I'm not gonna talk to my lender. That's the worst thing you can do. If I don't know what's going on, I can't help you. So, you know, it's not gonna say that it'll get approved every time, but, um, you know, say that it was a really wet, you know, fall, which it has been this year, but, it's a really wet fall, you've got some beans that are still out on the field, but once you get your beans out, you'll be able to make your payment. If I know that, I can help plan for that. Um, we definitely want you to make your payments in a timely manner, but things happen, it's farming. That's why it's cyclical, and you know we're there for through the good and the bad. And so be proactive, timing's everything. Again, let me know what's going on, and then let's have an annual meeting. I like this for a lot of my customers because we're able to gather balance sheets, maybe your tax returns, and really start building that trend. So even if you know you just have a line of credit with us right now or a small piece of equipment, once you get ready to purchase that piece of land, we have that information available and it's a lot easier to do. We can also work with you on, you know, I get folks that'll be like, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. 
if I already have your information, I can do a rough estimate of what cash flow is going to look like and how that's actually going to be projected so you know where you stand as well. So your lender is your partner, so just remember that. So next up is a business plan. So a business plan is really the best tool that you can have. Um, I put two different links up here. One is, of course, Firm Credit's blog on how to write a firm business plan. And the other one is Extension's um, business planning workbook. It's a really good thing to have, especially if you're starting out or even if you're established. It's still a really good thing to think about and kind of go through just to make sure you've checked the boxes. So do you already have a business plan or thinking about a business plan? Okay. So I will say most folks are like, well, I don't know where to start. I don't want to start. <laughs> um, it's too much to think about. And I will say that a business plan is just a roadmap. Destination can change. It doesn't mean it's set in stone or what you decide today is what you're going to do 10 years down the road. I mean, it's life, right? <laughs> I mean, that's just part of it. So with that, it's just to get started and starting to think about things, and it also help you start estate planning and seeing where you want your operation to go. Um, the main thing is it's not set in stone. So I have the business plan, little worksheet right here. Go ahead. I think it depends. Um, there is definitely going to be some parts that are going to be updated annually and that you're going to want to continuously review. It also depends on how your operation is moving forward. So I think it's always a good thing, no matter if you have a true, you know, this business plan right here, or you just have something written down. I think it's a good idea to go through your financials, your plans for the next year. So if you think about it, most of the time January and February is a little bit of a slow time for most farmers, right? That's when you get all your education things in, you know, you're, you're doing stuff. And I would say that's about the right time because you'll finish up most of your harvest, you know what your income's been, you know what your expenses have been for the previous year, and really sit down and think about where do I want this to go? What are our plans for next year? Do we have any capital requests that we're going to want to do? Um, are we going to change up and instead of doing um, traditional row crops, maybe we want to go organic? You know, just a really good reset at the end of the year that you can utilize a business plan with to just see how you want to progress. And that's really what it is, is just making sure you're having those check-ins to see where your operation's really at. Because if you, I, I go back to trends are so important, because if you've kept up with things, and it can be pencil and paper, it doesn't have to be typed up or an Excel spreadsheet or, you know, whatnot. It can be pencil and paper. Um, my daddy had a cow-calf operation and had a notebook with five tabs, and he had everything in there. Um, you can do it however it makes the most sense for you. But if you can see where your operation has came from and where it is now. You can see your good years, your bad years, and be able to average it out. You know what that projected cash flow is going to be for that next year pretty accurately. It could be a little higher, it could be a little lower, but you're going to know that average. And so when you start thinking about how you're going to plan for the next year, what even family living is going to be, you can utilize those past trends to figure out what makes the most sense for you. You know, it may be where you've got, I don't know, two different equipment loans right now, and if you put that third equipment loan on it, it's going to make you tight, and you're not going to feel comfortable. So maybe that's just something where you plan, as soon as that one equipment loan drops off, that's when I want to purchase this other piece of equipment. And it's truly about planning. And that's the main thing, especially in what we want to see, too. I mean, if you come to me and I know that your coverage ratio is like 107, right? So you're, you're meeting your, your, your responsibilities, but there's not much left. And you say, you know what, I really think I need a combine. It's going to be really hard to get that approved if we don't have some reduction in debt somewhere else. 
And I think that's where someone having a business plan, keeping up with their financials, makes such a big difference. And it makes you a better farmer, it makes you a better businessman or business person. Because even though farming is a way of life, it's a business, and that's how you have to treat it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key. So the question was, you know, a previous, you know, couple of years we'll say that may have had some low yields or low income and then, you know, it's increased because of either a change in business plan or just, you know, maybe you got a different seed variety, income went up. So that's part of having those trends and having those three to five year trends um, is that you can kind of see within three to five years your ups and your downs and you can average it. Because even though you have one good year, you may not have two good years in a row. I mean, we hope you do. I mean, I want you to have the best year, but. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. But I was able to accomplish buying the tractor without this question and stuff. Right. Was that, so the question was um, utilizing cash on hand versus a loan right. and cash flow, basically. So I would say that just because you have the cash on hand doesn't mean you have the cash flow. Right. And... Well, I mean, the, the cash on hand Right, but is it a one-year trend or is it going to continue? And that's where twofold too, because if you're farming, you're going to have good years where you have a substantial amount of income that you hope for but may not always utilize or see. Um, and I think that's where a balance sheet is going to show that. Obviously, it's going to show your increase in cash or you utilize cash to purchase an asset, and you're going to see that increase in hopefully net worth. Um, I will say it's still, that's a hard question for the fact that you're still going to want to utilize trends because even though you have one good year, you don't want to count just on that one good year to project what you're going to do. But um, yes, I think for the next meeting, it's a benefit because you're going to see that improvement not only in income, but also on your balance sheet, because you utilized it, right? And I think that's on a balance sheet. You know, folks will say, I made, I don't know, $100,000, right? Well, what did you do with that 100000 You know, is it in cash? Is it in equipment? Is it in land? Or did you utilize it for family living? And that's what we're going to really look at. Like, what have you done with your cash? And honestly, if you're utilizing cash, and obviously talk with your accountant, but if you're utilizing cash to purchase a piece of equipment, you're growing your balance sheet. And I think that's what it really comes down to is, how do you want to utilize your money? Because it doesn't matter what I say, <laughs> right? It's how do you want to utilize your money and how do you want to live? And I think that's just what you got to think about. But um, if you are increasing your assets, you're increasing your net worth, that's going to make a difference the next time you meet with a lender. Because we're going to look at your whole financial picture. And the nice part is you probably had a really good year, which will count towards your averages, which will then be utilized for the next time. So it's a win-win. Any other questions? You got a question? <laughs> okay. So I'm going to go through the business plan pretty quickly, um, but just really want to give you all a basis of what a business plan is and what you should think about. So first and foremost, you're going to have contact information. Please make sure it's accurate, because that's how somebody's going to contact you. Um, you know, folks will put, like, 
an old address or an old phone number. That does nothing for us. It doesn't do anything for you or for me. Um, so just make sure that contact information is correct. Um, next up is an executive summary. So it's really going to be, what's the highlight of your business plan? Do you have any expansion plans? Do you have any different marketing opportunities? Just some basic trends. It can be, you know, we've grown over the past three years, X, Y, Z. Just kind of, just a brief statement. Um, any kind of projections? What do you think you're going to be doing in your mission statement if you have one? And I will say this executive summary, if you only had to show one page of your balance sheet, this executive summary is, would be what you wanted to show them. So next up is introduction. Pretty basic from this standpoint of, you know, what do you produce? What do you market? What's the size of your operation or the location that you have? You know, are you 20 acres or are you 200 acres? What's your operation? Um, Short-term goals, it could be um, you want to, I don't know, pay off two equipment loans and have in the next two years or three years 20 more acres or 200 more acres that you're farming. Anything that's kind of, we'll say less than five years. And then long-term goals. And long-term goals can be in 15 years, my son or daughter is going to be, you know, or going to be done with college. We want them to come back to the farm. This is how we're planning to make that happen. If you're starting a new operation, it's a little bit different, but it's still same gist. But it's going to be how are you planning to start it and what's your course of action to build your operation. So it's really just putting pen to paper, this is what we're going to do. Or pencil to paper so it's erasable, but you get the gist. Um, and then next up is going to be, I will say on this, based going back to the introduction, um, it does talk about insurance, estate planning, retirement plans, just short little blurbs from that perspective. If we're talking about organization and management, definitely talk about how your business is organized. Is it a partnership? Is it a corporation, is it an LLC, sole proprietor? Whatever it is, just make sure you put it there. Um, what are the names and titles of folks? Is it a 50-50 ownership? Um, who manages the operation from a day-to-day? -day? That's what you're going to put there. Um, as well as there's like a little spot for an organizational chart. I will say with any of this, you can add appendixes to the back of it and just say reference, appendix, whatever. Um, this could be for some larger operations or just for in the near future, this is what you want to do. But it talks about benefits offered, reward structure. So if you have, maybe you offer health insurance. That's something to put there. And then it also talks about a contingency or an exit plan. So what are, what are your plans if something, something doesn't go right? That's what you would include there. I will say business advisors are truly important when it comes to a farming operation, whether it's new or established. You need to have a good accountant that knows a farm operation. Um, and I say that because they can help you utilize and ensure that you're prepared for that next tax year and for the future, maybe even if it is estate planning and transferring that ownership to the next generation or to whoever. Um, an attorney is good to have in case, you know, you're purchasing real estate, um, you're thinking about doing some different deals, whether you want to go from a sole proprietorship to an LLC. Attorney is a great thing to have around. Um, and then you do need an insurance agent that knows farming, that's able to obviously insure equipment, um, livestock. I know a couple of different insurance companies, actually, if you have livestock on the property or you have any kind of crops, they are not able to do a, um, oh, a liability insurance on you. And then an extension agent is always great. Um, they can help provide you with different resources. There's definitely a lot of different educational classes that come with that. 
and then a crop or livestock advisor. Obviously, um, in Maryland, having a nutrient management plan and having that relationship with that person is always important, too. So if you go to mafc.com, we have a good many blog posts. And I will say there is a networking dash beginning farmers dash farmers beginning dash farmers. There you go. Um, and it's a really good resource. And it kind of tells you the top six advisors or networking partnerships that you need to start out. It also includes like FSA. In RCS, those are the folk, kind of folks that you need to talk to and think about because they're going to know some different programs and opportunities that can benefit you. So the next page is production. It's really just going to talk about what are the products and services that you have. Um, do you have any production practices or value-added practices? And then what's your risk management? So that could be crop insurance, that could be NAP, um, that could be anything of that nature. And then we're also gonna talk about any licenses, permits, regulatory requirements, anything like that that you may need for your operation. And then the next is gonna be goals for your production growth or expansion. And I would say that could be like you wanna go from 25 mama cows to 75 mama cows. It would be something of that nature. Next step is marketing, and marketing really depends on the operation that you have. Um, I will say that if you are on the farm market, having a marketing plan is huge. And I will say with that, if you have on-farm tourism or customers or have a specialty crop in general, you may need a marketing plan separate from this. And really think about, you know, how are you gonna get to customers what is your marketing strategy? How are you going to grow? And you may be fine with being you know, where you're at, but if you're looking to grow, how are you going to reach that market and how are you going to compete with whoever else is in, in the area, right? So on the actual business plan itself, Facebook is a great, um, the comment was, I just put it on Facebook. And I will say, Facebook is great free advertisement. And it's a great, I mean, people share, people like, and it's a great way to get your name out into the local community. Um, and I think with any kind of social media, obviously you have to be cautious, but it is a great resource to use. And I would put that in there. Like, you know, we're doing monthly, um, I don't know, I always think too, like in the summer, like, you know, Joe Blow down the street may have um, half a dozen ears of corn for $6, and you do a promotion for $5. I mean, it's little things like that, but it gets customers' attention, and they come to you. And you're, you know, that's your promotions, that's your programs. Um, it's just a good way to do business is what it comes down to. And I will say, too, it could even be, from a marketing perspective, you know, it could be you're reaching out to, someone else down the street that may do canning. I don't know. You know, and that you're utilizing your products with their capabilities and you're selling something from that perspective. So, you know, what is some value added products or promotions that could utilize, you know, help somebody down the road as well as help yourself. So there's a couple of different ways that you can market your products and have a marketing plan that can really boost your business. But I will say social media, bless it or not, is a really good revenue or resource. Um, I will say too, and y'all have been in agriculture a good bit, but um, having that network and having those memberships and affiliations and being involved in the community is huge. And that's a great way to you know, grow your business too because the more you're out there, the more people know what you're doing. Next up is finances. <laughs> I feel like that's all we talk about is finances. But it is really important. So, um, you know, it's going to be the income earning um, potential for your operation. Um, if you have any historical performance, you're going to put that in the, here. And that can just be year over year trends. It can be how you work with your assets, how you manage those, any kind of capital requests. You're going to want an updated balance sheet. I will say that typically each year you need to update your balance sheet. Depending on 
what you grow or what you produce because you're really gonna wanna see, again, year over year trends. So just make sure you update and really start thinking about updating your balance sheet once a year if you aren't already. And then um, actual, your actual income statement, so what is it as of right now? So as of 2020, what's your, what's your cash flow gonna be? And then projected, so next year, 2021, you may get 100 more acres of ground, right? Well, that's gonna change what your income's gonna be. And so if you have a projected income statement, you can show this is what our expected income and expenses are gonna be. If you have historical performance, you can see what your cost per acre is gonna be or your income per acre, and you can accurately project for what that next year is gonna be. I will say um, part of this is if you're starting a new business, or even if you're not, I think a lot of people forget about family living. It's, a, it's an expense. And you need to make sure that when you're doing your projections and you're looking at your cash flow, that you take that into account. For new businesses themselves, like if you're just starting out, you really kind of need to think about having six months to a year of income just so you have that safety net and that you're setting yourself up for success. And that's what it's really all about. So that's basically a business plan in a really small nutshell. Uh, but do y'all have any questions about a business plan? It's really just doing it. I mean, that's just starting and just starting to write down. And you know, end of the year's coming up, January, February. Um, it's a great opportunity to start thinking about what your business plan is and what you're looking at for the future. So, I'll be honest with you, FSA really emphasized using extension budgets. I think they're a great resource. I think it's really good um, to get a good idea of what realistic income and expenses will be, especially if you're starting out and don't have that historical data to fall back to, because you can kind of see what average pricing should be, what average yields should be, and what your typical expenses are gonna be. Because I think sometimes, you know, you may forget, oh, you know, it's, you know, sometimes it's a wet year, you may have to go over the field more than twice with a fungicide, I don't know, whatever. And it's just thinking about those different expenses and just making sure you're realistic about what they're gonna be. Um, education opportunities, y'all are obviously here, so that is fabulous. Um, but your other education opportunities, I'm gonna make a plug for Farm Credits Ag Biz Masters. Um, it's a really good program that you do not have to be a farm credit member to be a part of. Um, and it goes even into more in depth about balance sheets, income statements, and just financial knowledge. Extension has wonderful classes. They have consultants or extension agents that can help you. Um, Future Harvest is a really good resource um, if you have some specialty or niche markets. And then Growing Fortified Maryland um, workshops are really kind of cool, as well as they have um, consultants that can kind of help you with different regulatory requirements. So if you haven't heard of them, you may want to check out their website. And then we kind of talked about it from an advisor standpoint, but you need to build a knowledge team and really look at, um, you know, do you have mentors in the area if you're starting out? Go back to an accountant, and then I made a plug for a loan officer, because you definitely need a loan officer. But, uh, <laughs> and then you also need to really think about those business consultants or specialty and industry ex experts, and just build a team around you to make sure that you are successful. And then, have y'all used any tools or resources before that have helped you, or, you know, even if you have, like, someone that does your nutrient management plan, I mean, <laughs> That's a huge thing for the state of Maryland or this area in general. So, yeah, having an agronomist is, I mean, that's where it comes in. I already moved the slide, but. <laughs> It's the whole county, right? Well, and I will say, so the um, comment was about taking county averages. And I would say if you have that 
if you have that past history I keep talking about, utilize your own past history because you know too what your ground can do and what truly your operation can do from that standpoint. And you know, there's better ground and there's worse ground. I mean, that's just part of it, right? It depends on what that soil composition is. Um, and so really knowing what your yields are or, you know, it depends on, you know, how much you're willing to spend in chemicals and fertilizer, right? It just really depends on your operation in general, what you're that, that yield's gonna be. <laughs> no, and I will say, so the comment was about, you know, different areas and whether they're a little more wet versus, you know, maybe they're a little more hilly or have a little slope to them and that water drains a little bit more. I mean, that makes a difference. And I will say, too, that's where, from a risk management standpoint, having that crop insurance or having that NAP is really important because that, that's protecting your revenue and that's protecting your income. All right, so I just put some different links and resources up here. So definitely check them out. I will say, make a little note about the campus.extension.org. Um, it's a really good tool to utilize all extension budgets across the US. So um, I've utilized Rutgers, Penn State, maybe Maryland didn't have the budget I was looking for. But if you, as long as you're within the region, I feel pretty comfortable about using budgets. Obviously, if you're going to Montana, maybe not as accurate. <laughs> but if you stick within the North Carolina, Virginia Tech, obviously, Penn State, Rutgers, it's a really good resource to use. And then that's it. So this is my contact information. If you need anything, definitely feel free to shoot me an email or give me a call. Um, you can definitely visit our website for additional information as well. So thank you all.